We're on to step five before we have lunch. We're getting through it, aren't we? Flipping it. Step five. So we're going to look at step five and then we're going to go into small groups to work out what step five means on the ground for us in our context. And then we'll have lots of Domino's pizza. So, step five. Identify evangelism networks. If you're an evangelism, this is the exciting part. If you're an evangelist, and I know there's one over there. Yeah, there's a few in the room. We should all be evangelists. We're all the, um, yeah, church planters. Church planters. Church planters is the most effective form of evangelism. That's why we're here. So, what this step is on about is people don't exist as individuals. That people clump together in networks. And then you're going to see that in whatever context you're in. When you're on a council estate, you will see what effect the gospel has on a network when a couple of people in that network become Christians. And mainly on estates, it's family or wider family. If you know your estates, you'll know that everybody's related somehow, that someone's had sex with somebody on the estates <laughs> that they shouldn't have done, because everybody is related. And what we've seen for us on the estate side is that when an individual gets saved and then a family will get saved and then it doesn't just stop there basically it just ripples through mm-hmm. and it doesn't mean that everybody in that network gets saved but the gospel spreads through that network and this is what this step is about it's not just about one person getting saved it's just having a longer view of this person is connected to a network what is it what's that network and how is the gospel going to get spread through that network and how what is our role in that mm-hmm. to enable that gospel to spread through just a side note, something I talk on a lot. Um, just think for 30 seconds about how you came to faith in Jesus. Uh, what, what happened? Was there a strategy in, that happened before? The person that shared Jesus with you, whether it was your parents or a friend, like what happened? Just think for 10 seconds and tell the person next to you. Go. Right, come back together. You'll have more time to talk about this. Here's a little suggestion. As John talked about this weight of a social project being put onto a small team, I want to suggest that the weight of an improper, an improper and unhealthy view of evangelism can crush a team as well. Let me just explain that. So, for many years in my life, um, I'm an evangelist. I want to see everybody and everyone get saved, and that is, that is the right thing, that's the right idea. Isn't it? But I, I had an unhealthy way in which that happened, in the sense that I took that on myself and became almost the creator of the universe myself. So it's my job to get everyone saved. And I didn't say that, but it's implicitly how I lived. And I wonder if there's others who maybe have that weight. And then I remember. We planted Oldham's church and the Lord taught us all sorts of things and we saw a bunch of people get saved and this guy came, a friend of mine came to me and and at that point 66% of the church were new Christians and he said, what is your evangelistic technique? And I remember saying to the Lord, Lord, what's our evangelism? (laughs) (laughs) I've failed, I've I've got a heart, historically I've got a heart to see people get saved but for some reason here you it's happening more frequently. We were, me and John, the reason we're together is because we've known each other for many years. And we were based in this church and we didn't see much fruit in terms of, and we were both evangelists who had a fiery heart to see people get saved. And, and I remember just the Lord drawing me back to John 6, 44. He says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them. And I think there's an, there's, we need some sovereignty of God back into our evangelism techniques. And that doesn't mean that we have to just sit back and wait for lost people to come. Because we need to be the church present out there, looking for the people who are being drawn. And what it meant for me is, I'm on my estate, I've got a dude in front of me who I'd love to get saved. But all of a sudden what I ask now is, Father, is this person being drawn to Jesus? Yeah. And if at this point they're not, then that changes what I need to do here. All I need to do is serve and love this person. I've taught the gospel up whenever I can, but I'm not going to save them because they're not being drawn right now. And that is hugely releasing. I find it hugely releasing. However, if the, if the answer here is this person is now being drawn by the Father to Jesus, and I have got a significant job to do, i.e. feed them the gospel as quickly as I can. 
and I've, I've seen this worked out and as we've sort of taught it in our churches you just see the evangelist just almost released into new power almost so our question our evangelistic strategy is who's next that should be the question who is next lord and so as we think about these networks of people you've got to teach the people in those networks to get who are going to get saved you've got to teach them this who's next the sovereign work of God in evangelism and our co-partnering work with the Spirit in feeding those people the gospel. I remember there's one guy on our estate, I've told this story before if you've heard it. Um, <laughs> the last time I did this I named and shamed him. He was, a, he was a prolific weed dealer on our estate, which on estates is fairly low key, like uh, most people take and deal with weed. But um, uh, I remember saying to the Lord, he would be great on our team. Like he's got some networks that we could manipulate here for the kingdom. And I just remember the spirit to say, he's not being drawn at the moment. It's just your job to be his friend. And then I remember asking literally about three times over four years and the same response kept coming. And so that was so releasing for me. I just was his friend. He'd come to church every so often because he'd start to see some of his clients get saved. And then um, three months ago, he was at a wedding of one of his former clients and we did a gospel preach at the wedding and then um, and one of them yeah and um, guess he stood up to say i'm i want to i want to take a step with this, this guy yeah. Yeah. now and he's we're no longer on that estate so he's, he's connected to the church the, the new leader. so anyway three fringes this is on your document this is on step five identifying your random networks three fringes that it's good to think about Institutional fringe, no fringe, and relational fringe. I'm not talking about a haircut here. We're talking about the people who are on the edge of your church. Lost people. Institutional fringe is the people who are coming to activities that you're putting on. So it might be a, a toddler group, it might be English classes, homework clubs. Who are those people in the institutional fringe? So those formal activities that you've got going on, and how are you going to connect with them? The no fringe is basically cold contacts. Like there's, we don't talk up enough cold contact evangelism. There's almost a fear of it, isn't there now? You don't do door knocking, do you? That was for the 80s, we don't do that anymore. Why not? How are you not gonna, if the job of us is to feed the hungry people, the people who are being drawn, we're gonna need to be in the place where the hungry people might be. So cold fringe, cold contact stuff is really important. How are you gonna do that? How are you gonna connect with those? The no, the no fringe, the people that aren't there yet. And, and then the relational fringe. This is the main way the church grows. Um, if you know the work of Rodney Stark, he's a sociologist and a historian, he's not a Christian, he studied the first 500 years of the church and how it grew from, we reckon 120, don't we? To around between four and six million. And he reckoned 98% of it was one person telling another. Like, it, it's just how... It, how it happens. So who is that relational fringe? Who do, who do, who, who do you know? And who does the person you, you're going to see saved, who do they know? And you con consistently encourage them to, to tell, invite, who are these people, how are you going to connect with them? And then we're just going to talk of a few opportunities. And then you're going to go into your small groups. The questions are on there, I think, aren't they? Yeah, six questions there for small groups as we're thinking about evangelism networks. What are the opportunities to see the gospel spread through the networks around us? Opportunity one, people who are open to the gospel, those open, those hungry people, who are they? How are you going to identify them? Opportunity two, who do you have in your team? There, there could be individuals in your team who have doorways and pathways into particular networks, whether it's just a language they speak, whether it's just a an activity they go to, they're passionate about, whether it's a workplace particularly, who, who, who is it on your team? Opportunity three, super spreaders. There's some people who just spread this stuff really easily and efficiently and quickly. So who are they? Um, this is, and actually, if you've got some of those, if you've got one of those people in your team, really look after them because those sorts of people can get quite... Super spreaders are often not Christians. Yeah, yeah, I was going to come to that. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Look after these people because they're often, they're often misunderstood and they can get frustrated easily because their heart is just to see people saved. 
Um, but yeah, like John said, super spreaders can be actually atheists who just love what's going on and love what you're doing. You've got some examples of that, haven't you? And we have as well. You might call these people people of peace. Yeah. So our super spreader here on the refugee project was this translator who was fueled. He was Iranian. He wasn't a Christian. He was fueled by a hatred for Islam. <laughs> He wasn't a Christian. And he would, you weren't allowed to evangelize in the refugee project. And this guy would come up to me and he would say, John, this man loves Jesus very much. And he's homeless. It's like a dead man. And you know, I have an amazing there was an amazing chair that just come to you up and say, I've got a homeless homeless society and would you put them up? And people would. And one time this guy got keep getting missed calls from a number, so I rang back. The guy's now been following the Lord for you know for years and stuff, but he was nagged by this guy, hassled by him, followed down stairwells at night saying, You ring the you ring the pastor, we have you run the The guy not even a Christian. He's not even a Christian. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Super spreaders. Uh, my example is uh, the guy I was talking about, he was an evangelist for our church, but he hadn't committed his life, he'd just be like to, to some of his clients even, is like, you should not be buying this weed off me, you should be sorting your life out and getting up to church. <laughs> opportunity for, um, opportunity for languages, networks. This is, I think, more common on a diverse side, but people linking into a specific language or culture. Um, opportunity five, buildings. We're a buildingless network, generally we don't own buildings, but buildings, certainly a, a one opportunity for evangelism. Is there a space that people find themselves at locally? Um, we certainly have, we, this is certainly more common on the state side. Opportunity six, what methods have worked before? What evangelistic methods have worked before? Alpha, different courses, try something. If it's not working, scrap it. That's the beauty of what we do in our network. We're not institutional in that sense. If it's not working, scrap it. I think with Christians have got too much of a problem with stopping stuff and mm-hmm. try something different. Opportunity seven, who has responded to us? Sometimes people, this is similar to the super spreader, but someone has just, God's just put this person in our path and they've responded. And looking at that person, who is it and what, again, like what gateway are they representing into, this, into a particular network? Opportunity eight, um, projects and institutions. Again, this is activities, uh, different things that are going on, formal activities that are going on. And again, like a word of caution, we say that um, just be super clear about what that activity is and how it's different to the church plant, maybe, and the evangelistic sort of intent. Opportunity nine, prophetic. The, the, the Lord that asks you to, to engage a particular network that seems counterintuitive, it seems like uh, this is going to be hard work or this doesn't feel that open but the Lord's told you to do it so get on with it. Um, so questions, just a few questions and we're going to go into small groups before lunch. Prayer is the key to all this, isn't it? Um, have you got personal examples of <coughs> evangelism, why, what happened to out of the three fringes, institutional, non, and relational, which one are you strongest and which one are you weakest in and why? What fringes do you recognise around your church and who are in these fringes? How can you bring the good news into these fringes with these networks of people? Maybe talk about some of the networks that you've seen around you. How can you keep the good news spreading through this network? Who's going to continue spreading the good news through this network? And then, as well as these opportunities that we've Identified. What other opportunities have you seen the good news shared through a network? Shared through a network. Um, and just a final note: doing evangelism isn't the goal. Seeing people encounter Christ, isn't it, is the goal? And like I said, just if you're not seeing people encounter Christ, then change it up. Just try something different. But remember, it's the sovereign Lord of all creation. It's His job. We're co-laborers.